Hi, it's uh, the second part of our talk uh, with Dimitris uh, from Athens. I uh, uh, will not try and pronounce his surname, sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm even less optimistic than Stepan is. Uh, uh, last time we, uh, we talked about your, uh, how, uh, about your career, about what uh, Bookbinder's life in Greece is like. And now we would really like to see your work. Uh, so, uh, hi, hi again. Uh, 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 which book will we start with? Hi, everyone. Um, I think we'll start with uh, the oldest one, which is the oldest of the bunch, at least, that I'm going to be showing to you. It's uh, my binding for Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare, the play of Shakespeare. Um, which is one of the few actually personal projects on my blog. And it's, it's this binding here. Let me, let me see if I can get this into focus. Yeah. So it's this binding here, which is a full French leather binding. Uh, it's also, I don't know if that's visible on the camera. It's also mottled. It's actually mm -hmm. dark gray with black spots on it. Yeah. And it's gilt in, in 22 karat gold, if I remember correctly. Now, um, and as you can see, the, the design is composed of Roman funerary masks, uh, which they molded off the face of the deceased. And it has a lot to do, of course, with the play, which, spoiler, has a lot of deaths in it. Uh, it's Shakespeare, of course. Sorry to interrupt. I should add that uh, in the modern days, it also reminds of the Game of Thrones. Somehow. Yeah, kind of, kind of. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, the, the interesting thing with this, with this binding um, is not the binding per se, but the story behind it, uh, which uh, is uh, a story of obsession, you could say. I, I wanted to take part in the designer's bookbinders competition. And this was the book I chose. And my, the design I wanted to do was initially very different. And I was, I was really excited you know, to make that and take part. And I did a lot of preparation. I did a lot of tests uh, during uh, the span of a year. And, and everything was great. But when I actually went ahead to make the binding for the competition, everything went wrong. Everything was a disaster. I, I could not wrap my hand around it. And so I took it apart and I made it anew. And the same thing happened and this happened two or three times. I, I, was, I was frustrated beyond words. And at the end I had to make something. So I came up with what you saw with, with this and I, I, I didn't feel it. And in the end, although it was ready in time, I didn't send it. I, I decided against sending it. And this whole, uh, this whole thing taught me a lot. Uh, don't know if you've ever, if you've ever heard of the sunk cost fallacy, uh, where you've invested too much in something to back out and it became a fixation and it cost me a lot it, i was uh, i was in complete burnout by the end and it was a very valuable lesson since then i've learned to to decline it, it has been easier to decline when i see that a project doesn't fit me or it will cost me more than it's worth. And 
I've also, I've also learned to abandon projects that are at least personal projects that are not going somewhere. And that's, that's not an easy thing to do. At least it wasn't for me because I'm a perfectionist. I want to get, you know, to, to get through, to get it done, to get it done in the way I imagine it should be done. And learning to say, okay, this doesn't work. I have to, I have to stop. I have to abandon it and move on to the next thing was, um, was valuable for me. So even if I didn't send the binding in the end, I got something important from it. When you say that it yeah. cost, it costs you a lot, you mean the book itself too. Uh, from what I remember, what I read uh, on your blog, uh, the book itself is an, uh, is an expensive and an impressive tome. It's a Ballantine book, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it's, uh, it's amazing, really. It's it's a very mm. very beautiful. I don't know if I can get you to, to see. Here is. Title and uh, you should you should see the paper. I mean, it's it's amazing. <laughs> uh, it is, it it, is amazing. It's uh, what is it? Early twentieth century, right? Uh, let me see. I think it is. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. the The real cost was not was not the book cost, which was expensive, of course. Uh, the real cost was um, something that you cannot get back. You know, your your energy, your time, and the stress that you go through, and you you can't put a price on that. It's it's always too expensive. It's always uh, the cost is always a lot. You can never you can never have uh, too little stress as much as you can avoid it as much as you can have peace of mind you should you should try to do that uh, have the wounds healed do you like it now uh, um, hmm. i think i appreciate it much more than i did back then back back then i hated it i i even made an ugly box and kept it in there for two years I, I never looked at it during those years, um, but you know, there's there's so much of me in that that I I can't ignore it. I it's uh, it's one of my children. Uh, you know, I have to accept it. Yeah, I guess I guess every artisan has to have. Uh... A project like that, uh, well, it's better not to have it and to 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 get this understanding that uh, some things are better, uh, some some things are better not to be done, and uh, some sometimes time is better to be saved and money and all that stuff and emotions. Uh, but we are all our people, and uh, it's it's uh, we usually learn on, on our own mistakes. And uh, I also had a project like that. I had a uh, uh repair pro project uh, on a um, hundred year old very expensive book and I, sp I it, 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 it was supposed to be a simple rebacking project and uh, I in the end I said spent something like 100 on 120 hours on uh, uh, restoring the book and I hated it and uh, I didn't charge the customer in the end because uh, the original price we agreed on was too low and I wasn't ready to you know to sell my work for for such a petty money and i wasn't ready to negotiate a new price and uh, yeah i was angry with myself i was angry with the customer i was angry with the book and uh, it was an important experience uh, but uh, a really hard one mm. it's true it's true you know the the more you get um the more you get knocked around by by difficulties and projects that test you uh, the better it is down along the way and i'm i'm fairly glad that uh, somewhat glad at least that 
I had this experience early on um, because, because it was very different. It was, you know, kind of a singularity. Things were different. It was, there's a pre-Titus Andronicus era and an after Titus Andronicus era. Uh, have you ever entered another competition or was it? Oh, yeah. Well, I did. And uh, the result was the same, although for a completely different reason. I, I think there was a competition a few years ago that had to do with, with myths and heroes, uh, again, by designers, bookbinders. And I had a copy, a folio society copy of Arabian Nights and um, I had uh, some some very interesting things in mind for that one but um, two things happened and in the end I I didn't take part I didn't send the book although I had paid for the for the entry fee uh, the one thing was that I was preparing the leather and uh, which I had, uh, I had done a lot of work on it. And when I was pairing it, I did the awful thing and paired through the leather at the head cup. And you can't fix that. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's totally wasted. Um, there was no repairing that. So I didn't have enough time to get a different leather, you know, a proper leather. There wasn't enough time to order one, to get one and to work on it. And also some, some different things happened uh, regarding work, something urgent, I don't recall exactly what. So I had to, I had to move on. However, it was, I was frustrated, but it was much easier to do so after after Titus Andronicus. I just accepted that, you know, competitions are not for me. Um, what what, what can I now? say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this happens. Uh, so should we, should we proceed with the, another one? Yeah, sure. The, okay, let's go with a very recent one which is this. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the colors, which is an electric blue and, and fuchsia. No, there is some, some, there's something like yeah, pink and, or ruby. And, and even yeah. purple. Yeah, on exactly. Some, on some uh, of yeah, the purple. rooms, yeah. Mm. yeah. So, it's it's this thing here. So let me open it for you. And kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And here's a look on the interior. Whoa, this is okay. spectacular. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing paper. Is it is it hard to work with this with this paper or no no not at all trouble. So, as uh, as Stepan mentioned earlier, I've made all the brass parts and ornaments myself, and this this is a very a very me project. It has many of the things I I like I enjoy on it. Um, it has to do with, you know, fantasy. It has to do with uh, coming up with puzzles. Uh, it has to do with um, with metalworking, storytelling, uh, problem solving. At least, you know, when it comes to how can I achieve this result? How can I make something work? Uh, and it's it's something I've been wanting to do for for many many years, and it it really it really shows the direction I would like to be 
you know, moving towards. I would like to be able to, to do more projects like this in the future because it allows me to explore pretty much everything I like in book binding. Um, it has also an interesting feature. You might be able to show it in photos as well, but I'll try to, to demonstrate it for you here. The, the studs on the corners have hidden gemstones in them. <laughs> wow, that's nice. Which you can, which you, which you're supposed to, you know, to discover that they're there and then, and then use, use them, place them in the sockets in the central star. And supposedly it reveals something. That's, that's one of the aspects of this project. I really like that it's, it's a binding that, that allows you to explore it, to play with it. And it has, it has secrets. It has a story to tell. And that story uh, can, be, can be many things. It can be anything the person using it wants. So I, I think this, you know, this opens very, very interesting paths to, to explore. It's something I'm, I'm really looking for. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the book itself? It's covered in runes, but those are not Nordic runes, right? No, no, uh, they are. They they are actually a modified version of Futhark, um, and I've made some some small custom tools in order to be able to you know to tool them. Um, and they they if you if you translate them you don't get a readable text you get uh, gibberish and you have to find out how to how to to make a sense of it as well it's it's kind of a a riddle a puzzle so there are there are several layers and you have to go through all of them to finally discover uh, that there are gemstones and what you must do with them. And I, I wanted, you know, for this to be, to be intriguing. Uh, I think people interested in, uh, in fantasy and tabletop games will, you know, will get, will get what I'm going for here. Uh, yeah, definitely. Because uh, its purpose is to be to take you somewhere else, you know, to hold this binding, to explore this binding, and feel that you are in a different world, that you are holding um, a magical artifact, even if it doesn't have the properties like we talked <laughs> before. So. That's it. I I was actually inspired for the design by Astrolabs, which is um, mm -hmm. a, a tool you could say uh, sailors use to orient themselves oh, based okay. on the location of stars. Yeah. Um, it's been it's been quite a complex and intricate project, but I think I'm, I'm really happy with how it turned out. And, and that's a rare thing. I'm, I'm rarely happy with how something has turned out. <laughs> well, I, I, I would definitely like to see your next experiment uh, in, the, in this area. <laughs> um, I, I really like the result too. Have you ever heard of uh, Codex Serpinianus? Luigi yeah, Serpinian yeah, sure. Book. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> It's somewhere in, the, in that kind of uh, direction. An uh, encyclopedia of a made up world. Who doesn't like that? Mm, exactly, exactly. You know, um, there's, there's some mystery in it involved. And you feel 
uh, you feel with such, you know, with such um, uh, obscure or strange books that there is something we still don't know, you know, something the, the author, the creator had discovered and it remains a secret. And that's, that's something very, very exciting. It, um, it's no wonder people have been trying to decipher such books for you know for centuries and i think i think it would be disappointing if they actually in a sense if they actually manage to decipher it you know the mystery would be gone oh every time i hear that somebody cracked the voynich manuscript i think to myself oh no <laughs> No, don't do that. <laughs> Why would you spoil it for everyone? I mean, <laughs> keep it to yourself. Could you talk about your Hamlet book a bit more? Uh, uh, so we're we're now moving moving to the books that Dimitris doesn't have in his place right now. So we will we will show some uh, photos of them, and uh, we will also look at the photos on our laptops. Uh, just to be in context. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've already mentioned uh, earlier about how you uh, composed the design out of letters. Uh, could you uh, uh, walk us through the process? How did that work? How do you do it exactly? Uh, you mean composing the design with letters? Yeah, and no, and translating it into the finished uh, product. Uh, uh, do you to uh, to it? Was it uh, all prearranged? Did you first design it out of letters and then repeated it precisely, or was it more of a, a freestyle? I mean, did you come up with it as you went? Well, I I cre I created an outline of the. Uh, of the rough shape and I try to to fill it with letters uh, in a way that will you know make sense visually uh, as a final result um, it was it was strange because I I don't feel comfortable with just just going with the flow I I need to have some preparation some sort of um, guidelines to what I'm doing. And so I had to be very intuitive while creating this design. And it was it was something it was something challenging for me. But in the end it came out well. You know, it's uh, the the letters did their thing and it looked uh, it looked pretty much as I expected it to. Uh, basically what I did was create a rough outline of the, of the crown and start uh, ink stamping on tracing paper, each letter of the alphabet, uh, using it in various places. And gradually the design, you know, filled up uh, became complete. Yeah, the, the, because that's another thing that I noticed. Uh, there's neither too much of space between letters, nor too little. Mm. It's, you, you, clear, you clearly went on until it just felt right. Exactly. Uh, so it, it, it didn't feel crowded, but it also didn't feel, uh, I don't know, too prearranged. I mean, it 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 it, fe it feels mm. rather uh, free. So the pro the process clearly worked. That was uh, that was the intention. I wanted something that would look at the same time chaotic and orderly, because that's what you get with, you know, when you go to uh, when you deal with power. Power is a contained chaos. It's it can it can have unexpected um, outcomes through its actions. Uh, a lot of people struggle for it. It uh, has side effects. Its its very existence has side effects that uh, we never really comprehend in their entirety. So I needed something that would um, relay 
the nature of power. And that's also the reason I, I gold tooled the design in, in genuine gold because power is valuable and um, the crown crowns themselves are valuable as an object but their their true value lies in the power they grant their owner and gold is um, is a great material of course for that but um, there's also there's also more to it because and and that's why that's what i i try to do with designs at least when inspiration allows it or uh, the client's budget or request um, are not are not an obstacle i i like the designs i do ideally to have a lot of symbolism in them to have uh, interconnected and overlapping layers of meaning so that you can interpret a decorative element or you know part of a design in in many ways uh, for for example the letters on the crown also represent shakespeare's writing which uh, as time has proven is is a peak in in writing in language and so uh, there there are a lot of there's a lot of meaning in that crown and in in many different it has many different facets well that that's where a good education helps quite a lot <laughs> i guess Sometimes I ask our guests this question, and uh, I, I wanted to ask it now because I see that uh, the box is also not not a simple one. And uh, uh, different book binders have different approaches to book boxes. Uh, for some of them, uh, box is just a container that protects the book. For for other book binders, box is a continuation of uh, of a binding, and they try to implement or uh, you know, uh, widen some ideas they implemented in the book book design uh, to the uh, book box. And uh, here I see that uh, there's also an ex libris on, on the mm. book box. And uh, I, I don't think it's pretty typical, typical to have an ex libris on the book box. So can you uh, say a bit about, tell us a bit about your relationship with book boxes and uh, this ex libris and uh, how it all came around? <laughs> Uh, well, so uh, my relationship with books, with book boxes. Um, hmm. Well, I for the most uh, for most of my years. Besides, besides the ugly book, the the ugly box you made for, for for the competition book you 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 discussed before. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. Um, I can I can actually show that to you. It's it's this thing here which is, you know, as you can see, <laughs> atrocious. It's just a board with some craft on it. That's, that's how much I hated the book at the time. So uh, I didn't, I didn't used to make a lot of boxes because uh, I didn't have a board shear. And when you have mm -hmm. to cut everything by hand precisely to, to, and by precisely, I mean half a millimeter more or less yeah. Um, yeah. matters a lot in box making. Uh, it's it's a real struggle to do that, you know. So I avoided uh, making a lot of book boxes. I I really like them. I really like the um, the opportunities they offer in terms of design mm -hmm. and making them. Uh, a part of of you know of the project i don't view them as simple containers uh, although they must be able to you know this is their prime function they have to be able to protect the book properly uh, if not it doesn't matter how pretty they are <laughs> but um, yeah, 
I, I think I only recently had the opportunity to, to make such, such a, a box, uh, a clamshell box, which uh, I suppose we'll talk uh, along the way about the South Sea scheme. Um, I would like to, I would like to do more, you know, uh, but as always, it, it really depends on, you know, on the client's uh, um, requests and budget. And what about the, the ex libris? Oh, yeah, the ex libris. How to be? The, the ex libris, uh, which is, <clears throat> I actually try to look, look it up. And I, I couldn't think of a way to incorporate it in the binding um, properly, at least. So mm -hmm. since, since it's, it's a very beautiful, um, it's, it's an artwork, basically, all Ex Libris are. I thought it could be part of the display. And uh, I think I discussed it with the client and he agreed or something of the sort. And it, um, it creates, I think it creates a nice, um, a nice context. You can, when you have the case in, in front of you, you can see the title and you can see the ex libris. And there you have, you know, a first description of what's inside the case and a sort of an identity to the book. And then you open it and you go to the, to the book itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. Do you have any any uh, specific uh, element of of the of, uh, of book binding that's more you know that you like 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 the most? For example, my my little thing is uh, end bands. I always mention them. I always uh, you know notice them. I always look for them in in the museums and. Uh, uh, that's my shtick. And uh, what's what's your thing? Mm. Mm. When it comes to my bindings or bindings in general? Well, when it comes to well, in the first place, when it comes to making books. Mm. Uh, so, uh, what's what the what's the most interesting part of the process, uh, the element, uh, or the I don't know, uh, the the process itself you you like to do, for example, tooling or well, I, sewing ad band, end bands uh, or, or something like that. I, I really enjoy pairing leather. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it, especially if, if it's a nice leather. Um, it, have you have you seen uh, uh, Arthur Green from Green's Books yeah. uh, just posted yesterday his pairing station? Did you see that? No, I haven't seen you the post. Too? I I know I know I know the binder though. Um, yeah, he he just yesterday or day before yesterday he posted that he made a special uh, pairing booth for himself. It's uh, just a, a sort of uh, enclosed uh, area so that all the shavings do not fly around. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> always a problem. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I guess you should check check his recent post and uh, um, it it, it, it's, it really looks nice, you know. <laughs> I. I really enjoy the process because it it requires a combination of intuition. You have to really feel where what what's what's going on, but at the same time you have to you have to have a good technique. You have to have control. You have to be able to to monitor uh, the blade in in regard to three different angles. So it's um, it's a challenging combination of um, of of skill and getting a feel of what's what's going on. Uh, I mm -hmm. I hate, however, I hate pairing pairing the joints, thinning down the joints. I will I always yeah. find it frustrating. Yeah, it's such a stressful yeah, process. Yeah, exactly. And of <laughs> course, pairing is not uh, is not enjoyable when you get to pair through the end bands, as I've mentioned. 
Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's. I think it's the part I like the most. When it comes to uh, the thing I I notice on bindings, I enjoy. Hmm. Um, I I think it might be. Uh, I think it might be the joints. You know, seeing seeing a smooth function, it's it's very satisfying. Um, mm -hmm. Because you can do a lot of nice things with decoration or you can make a wonderful head cap but it's it's all for nothing if you know if the joint doesn't function properly it will come apart mm -hmm. and so it's it's one of the things i'm really interested in and um i want to you know to hopefully someday perfect in my work as well Okay. And, and, what, and what about materials? So many of our guests experiment with new materials uh, uh, all the time. Do, uh, do, uh, do you stick to leathers or do you, like to, uh, do you like to combine novel materials like plastics? Uh, have you ever experimented with those, Faith? Hmm. Let me think. From time to time, I've used some, you know, some strange materials, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's my thing. Um, it's, uh, I think I feel more comfortable with, uh, with leather and, you know, the more uh, traditional roster of materials, but I, I commend experimentation with, you know, with different, with different things. And I would like at some point to do something completely out of my comfort zone when it comes to materials, you know, to use things that are not traditionally used or things that I would, that I wouldn't like to use, perhaps to force myself to use them in some weird project, but I don't feel ready for it yet. Uh, I think you have to, you have to, to mature a bit in order to be able to take something out of that process or else it's just, you know, just playing around for the sake of playing around. And I'm not, I'm not very much into that. And what about the leathers? There are so many different kinds these days. Uh, a few months back, uh, one of our guests showed us uh, fish skin leather, and it was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I've seen I've seen a few of those. Um, it's uh, leather is an amazing material. There's there's so much variety in it, and the fact it's it's sort of a living material, you know. Um, really, really requires from you to, to understand it. It's not something that you can simply take and use. You have to get to grips with it. You have to, to, to get to know it. So I, I, have, I have many leathers. I've, uh, I've snake leathers, eel leathers, frog leathers, but um, I don't, I don't get to use them often. You know, they're strange. They, they need to really fit in, in with a specific book. And so for the most part, I stick to, you know, uh, uh, goat skin and whatnot. Um, try, I try to as much as I can to, to get good quality book binding leather, but of course uh, it's not always easy. For example, right now with the with the pandemic going on uh, and Brexit, I I just at some point realized that all my suppliers are from England, you know, and and I freaked out. Um, oh yeah, yeah. I had this moment as well. Yeah, yeah. It's at some point I was thinking that okay, I I get my gold, I get my leathers, I get my tools, I get my papers from the UK, and, the, and it was panic mode. What what am I going to do? Um, 
Anyway, well, pay 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 twenty one percent more, or, or how, how much your VET is in Greece? I'm not sure. Mm, it's uh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, leather. There's, I think, I think you would need uh, three lifetimes to to fully explore the potential of leather. So I'm uh, I'm. I'm content with it at the moment. I would like, I would like to do some more crazy things, but again, because most of my work is commissioned bindings, you know, the the client has to be on board for something freaky. Can you actually incorporate those exotic leather leathers? If I heard correctly, you said eels and frogs, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you combine uh, those uh, as elements? I mean, can you insert them or do you have to bind an entire book uh, uh, into a crocodile? I don't know. Well, in most cases, they are, they are either, uh, at least these leathers, they're either too thick or too stiff. So you have to, to onlay them mostly. Uh, and they're, they're usually small also or narrow. So you can't really bind a book in them, unless it's a very small book, unless it's a miniature book, which, uh, which are very, very fun to make. Um, but uh, yeah, mostly it's mostly uh, for decorative purposes and not, you know, fully covering the book. Have you ever had any experience with miniature books? Well, uh, the the smallest book I've bound is uh, is not very small. It's uh, an A6 size, um, okay. yeah. which is not considered a miniature by any miniature. measure. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, even even so, I it's it's one of my favorite bindings. It, there's something there's something so interesting in going you know in going small size when it comes to bindings. Um, you you have to think differently and everything looks i don't know more 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 intriguing more interesting um and what about the tools do you have to use the miniature tools mm, yes and no it depends you can many of the tools we use can be used uh, in a miniature binding but you'll be able to you know, place less of them on it. Um, there are also some miniature tools, but you have to, you know, you have to be really into miniature bindings to, to invest in those. Because uh, if you want to have those, it means you want to do um, scaled down versions of, you know, of proper decorations. And that's a whole different story. Can we talk about the South uh, Sea scheme? Because that's an unusual project. Some, somehow I didn't see it before uh, in, on, on, on your Instagram or, or on, on, on your blog. And so when you sent us the photos, I was like, wow. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I guess uh, mission accomplished, if, uh, if that's the reaction. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it was an interesting project. Um, the, the idea was, uh, was the client's idea, actually. He is one of those people that get really creative when it comes to, to planning a binding. And he, mm -hmm. he often has interesting or challenging ideas. And he has a massive collection of marble paper, an amazing collection. And uh, he had he had uh, these marble papers from uh, uh, I can't recall his name uh, from from a marbler. I think he's in Spain. Anyway, and a lot of them had those you know swirls, but they were very very intricate. They were these are amazing papers, and. He envisioned one of them as as the as a stormy sea, 
And mm -hmm. so he came to me and said, what can we do uh, with this? Uh, can, we, can we make something out of it for this specific uh, book, pamphlet? And it, um, it, was, it was really interesting getting to work on this because it required uh, a shift in, in how I approach marble paper. It's not, it's not a decorative paper anymore. It's part of the design uh, in, a very, in a very essential way. Um, and that's, that's uh, one of the things I enjoy when you get to, um, to, to reevaluate and reintroduce yourself to materials and stuff you already use. It's, it's always fascinating to discover that there's, there's more to this. Okay. I, it's been something I've been using for years and there's more to explore. There are many more uses anyway. Um, and so I, I had to, to incorporate it in the design to, to create a stormy sea out of this marble paper. And that was very challenging because it's, it's a very, uh, it's a very fine marble paper. It has very, very thin strips, um, I don't mm -hmm. think it's it's really visible in the photos, even though I tried my best to capture it. And I had to cut it in a way that wouldn't, you know, put someone off. Um, it wouldn't feel unnatural. It, it had to blend with the design, but I also, uh, it had to blend with the, I mean, the pattern of the marble paper, but it also had to work for the design. So, I, I, spent, I spent quite a few hours trying to see how I should cut it. And as I write at my blog, I felt like a stone cutter, like a lapidarist, which, you know, study a raw diamond for, for weeks and sometimes months to, to get the most out of it, to, to remove as little material as possible and bring out its beauty as much as possible. Um, so uh, that was that was uh, an exciting thing with this project. Uh, this piece of marble paper is uh, pretty stunning and uh, its implementation is also stunning, but it sort of steals the attention from all other elements of the uh, of, of this cover. Uh, which is good, I guess, because every time you look at it, you see some new details. So I, I love uh, uh, how you made this uh, chain light, lighting, mm -hmm. lighting bolts. I love the blind tooled uh, sunken ships on the, on the bottom. I love how the volume is created by the bubbles. Some of them are blind tools and other are gold tools. I, I, I just, I'm impressed with the uh, title because uh, red uh, human rights uh, uh, text is really uh, falls out uh, of the whole picture and makes you sort of stop and uh, mm. uh, you know, read it and- uh, Contemplate, uh, and yeah. And other things. So it's lots of, lots of small things that create all this uh, uh, whole picture. And uh, uh, it's, uh, well, as you said earlier, you, you, you have to, you know, make a lot of discoveries with this uh, project. Hmm. Exactly. There's, uh, there, there are a lot of things going on in this design and um, it, uh, it, it comes back to what I, what we discussed earlier that I, I want the designs I make or the bindings I make to have, you know, to have layers in them, to have um, overlapping symbolisms. And you can take, for example, the, the ship. The ship is literal, but it's also, you know, figurative. Uh, it's, uh, it can be translated as, uh, you know, as the very ship or ships they used. Uh, it can be translated as their business venture, which was, you know, fraud. 
basically, and it sunk. And you can translate it as the, the, the harm and the decline in ethics because there was slave trade involved in all of this. And that's where the chain also comes in. It has many meanings. And I, I'm happy. I'm happy with how this turned out because as you said, uh, there, is, there is much to explore and the, the binding sort of, sort of invites you and also challenges you to, um, to interpret it. You know, to, to find meaning in what you see. And uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting elements. For example, the fact that the ship is sailing on the front cover and it sunk at the back cover was on purpose because when you first, if it's lying on a table, when you first take it out, you see the front side and then you turn to see the back side. Oh, that's how it ended. Oh. So there's, there's some storytelling there as well. And it, that aspect also continue, continues on the inside because when you open it and remove the pamphlet, you see that behind everything, oh, it's the pound sign, it's money. That's the cause, the root of evil and suffering. And the client when he received the binding also made an interesting remark he said that the this box this case looks very luxurious but it also has um, a deathly aura to it it's also like a coffin of sorts and that really ties in with with the story um, behind the South Sea scheme. And I think I think it's it's a good example of what what I perceive design bindings to be, uh, at least my interpretation of it. It's interesting. Uh, when I saw this cover, uh, I uh, didn't uh, even uh, think that I knew about South Sea scheme before. So the, uh, this, uh, the words didn't uh, ring the bell, but then I looked at the photos, I saw the chains, I saw the, um, the pound sign, I saw the sinking ship, and it immediately clicked what it, uh, what it was all, uh, all about. The, uh, I start, started to remember all those uh, mad uh, uh, colonial ventures. Well, let's go and conquer an island. Okay, let's go, let's go and enslave thousands and uh, thousands of people. We can do that. We are a, a, a world power, and you can sort of see uh, uh, your uneasy. Uh, uh, feelings about uh, about it mm. because of course it was a great uh, adventure and yet it was more morally fraud but then it wasn't at the time not many people talked about it as a bad thing then and we can sort of appreciate what they did and also uh, stand on a high moral ground from our point of view mm. It's, uh, it's one of the reasons uh, the human rights is, is not, uh, as you might see, it's, it's part of the title. It's not just an added element. The final, final letter and of South and uh, no, the final letter of C and Scheme are incorporated in human rights, uh, because those are inter intertwined, you know, uh, you can't, you can't have such endeavors without causing harm, without, without questioning uh, what is, what is right and what is not. And, and as you said, you have to be somewhat uncomfortable looking when you look at this binding. You have to feel a bit 
strange because what you see uh, has has a lot of uh, has a lot of suffering in there. Has a lot of uh, uh, of the vices that cause a lot of harm, and you have to be able to translate that into a binding, but still make it a good binding. You know, still make it something that looks beautiful but conveys, you know, the the essence of what happened. I don't know what to say after that. That is that is an impressive work on, on many levels. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, should we move on to the workshop tour? How how do you feel about it? Yeah, sure. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dimitris. It was a great pleasure to see you uh, al almost like in real life and uh, to finally talk to you and to hear your story. Uh, thank yeah. you. I thank you very much yeah. uh, again for the invitation. And it was, it was a great talk. I, uh, as, I, as I've said, I was kind of nervous at the, you know, at the thought of it, but uh, it was nothing like that. It was it was great. Yeah, I hope you will return to to our podcast, maybe to the shorter version of our uh, podcast, uh, Bookish Talk, uh, to discuss uh, some of your new tools or bindings in the future. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Would be a pleasure. And and uh, many thanks to all our community members, uh, all uh, everybody who uh, is subscribed to our channel uh, on YouTube or who visits uh, our Instagram account. And uh, a special thanks to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, thanks to their uh, pledges, we are able to pay for editing of these videos. And that, uh, that, that really helps a lot. Uh, if you are ready to uh, um, share a dollar or more per month with us, uh, please uh, use the link below and uh, become one of our uh, Patreon supporters. This year, it may be even more important because we have some plans to uh, add additional hosts to our project and uh, uh, include a, a start a French speaking branch of our podcast. Uh, and uh, this will be uh, possible, of course, if we have enough budget for that. So <laughs> join the crowd. <laughs> uh, thanks. Thanks a lot for watching. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, uh, consider subscribing. And uh, uh, see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.